Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Good morning. Um, hey, before I get started, these guys would never, ever, ever, ever say this or let you know, so I'm going to say it and let you know just how incredible these volunteers are. You know, if you're like me, you know nothing about music and you couldn't carry a tune even if somebody handed it to you in a bucket. Amen? That's me. I know nothing about music. It all sounds the same to me. Uh, but there is technical stuff. You got to get the sound right and you got to do this and you got to do that. And these guys spend hours and hours and hours preparing before they even get on stage during the week. And I don't understand it all, but they do something. They get everything set up so that when they can come in on Sunday morning, all the keys are laid out and all this is laid out and they just go to town. Well, all that crashed this morning. And so they had to start from scratch, okay? And they pulled that off. And I'm just so appreciative of you guys for doing that. And it's like I told them, it's like I told them, uh, I said, look, 90% of the people are not even going to notice. And the 10% that do, eh, they'll get over it, right? All right. So, happy Thanksgiving. It's over. Merry Christmas. Y'all ready? Yeah, yeah, my time of year, I love it. Um, man, I hope you had a good week. I know Thanksgiving can be hard for some. I know Edward mentioned it last week, you know, uh, Thanksgiving can be hard for some. For me, it's great, I love it. It's, uh, let's see, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, three whole days of just eating stuff I'm not supposed to eat and uh, watching football which is one of my passions college football I love college football I don't know how many of you watched any games this weekend um, but uh, if you've noticed that uh, especially in college and high school uh, these sports teams and these universities are very proud of their schools amen you hear the saying, you're not supposed to play for the name on, on the back. You play for the what? The name that is on the front. And it got me to thinking, you know, you're watching these games and all of these universities and all of these schools have some sort of thing that they raise up, a banner or a symbol. All right, you tracking with me? All right, for you, you guys that love the Longhorns, this is your, your deal, right? All right, any Longhorns in here this morning? All right, seven and five season. Good job, guys. Um, and then... <laughs> For the Aggies, it's the, it's the thumb, all right? Fellow Ags in the house, yep, we're terrible too. That beat down last night was, was brutal. Um, the best team in the state of Texas is Baylor. What in the world? Jesus must be coming back soon. <laughs> Amen? And they've got the little bear claw, I think, thing going on over here. How many of you watched the Iron Bowl yesterday, Alabama and Auburn? All right, are there any Alabama people in here? And, and, and I do have an Auburn friend, by the way. I didn't know those existed until I met uh, Nate and Victoria. And then uh, I didn't know Alabama fans existed either until they started winning. And they just all came out of the, like, yeah, I've been rooting for them my whole life. Yeah, whatever. I don't believe that for a second. But here's what's confusing about Alabama and Auburn. Auburn, what the heck is their mascot? Okay, Auburn is supposed to be the Tigers, yet they have this war eagle. So are they the Tigers or are they, are they the Eagles? Or are they the Tiger Eagles? What are they? Alabama is even worse. Crimson Tide, Elephant, or Toilet Paper. I don't get what Alabama is trying to do with the Roll Tide. Now, 
I went to school, my high school's nickname was the Pirates. And I remember at our football games, we had a massive, just massive pirate flag. I mean, it was very, very cool. In this community, we have, who do we have? We have the Hawks. Down in Hawkins, we have the Eagles over in, over in Harmony. We have the, the Wildcats down in Big Sandy. The Yellow Jackets in Mineola, although they're orange and white. I'm trying to offend everybody today. Am I, am I getting close? Yeah? All right. Okay. And probably the most famous symbol of all where we live, the star on the helmet. I don't know what they're trying to do this year. Get somebody fired or, or start over. Do you realize since their last Super Bowl like 100 years ago, they've basically just been a 500 team. So 6-6 six and six this year is right up their alley, right? But here's what I know. Here's what I know. Regardless, listen, regardless of the record, regardless of the beatdown, win, lose, or draw, there's a pride that we all carry for whatever school or whatever team that we root for. In fact, in high school and college, even when you lose, you gather in front of your band to do what? You play your alma mater, your school song, in front of your flag or your banner or your symbol. One of the most awesome things for me, especially in the political climate that we live in now and the tension that we live in now, is any time the United States competes, whether it's in World Cup soccer or whether it's in World Basketball or the Olympics, and we all for just a moment kind of take a time out from disagreeing with everybody, and then we all rally around and we root for the good old USA. And what's really cool is these Olympic athletes, when they're finished with their race or with their jump or with whatever they're doing, a lot of them will wrap themselves in that flag in celebration. It's a symbol. It's a banner, so to speak. And it represents to that athlete or even to the band member or even to just the Joe Schmo like me that sits in the stands and holds up my finger because my kids go to Hawkins or holds up a thumb because I root for A&M or whatever. It's a symbol of pride. It's a symbol of loyalty that no matter what, I am an American and I root for the USA no matter what. You know, if, you, if you're the Dallas Cowboys fan and as horrible as they are, well, maybe that's a bad example because some of you are jumping off the bandwagon. But for schools, you never, ever leave your school. And there's a symbol of pride every time you see that banner. There's a symbol of loyalty every time that you see the symbol of whoever it is that you root for. You know, we've been in this series called The Names of God. We're going to close that out today with one of the most fascinating names that we see in Scripture about God. Today we're going to be talking about Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. The Lord my banner. Jehovah Nisi. The name Nisi literally in the Hebrew means banner. Sometimes it's translated as this, a pole with an insignia attached. So just think about when you hear that word Nisi, we're talking about either some sort of a flag that sits high on a pole, some sort of a banner that it sits high on poles, some sort of sign that sits high on a pole, and it has a certain insignia or a certain symbol that is attached to it. When nations would go to war in battle in, in Old Testament times, the nations would carry that flag or that pole in front of them. They would put it on the front lines of whoever was in the front lines of those armies, and they would march into battle carrying those flags. It was a symbol that gave their soldiers a feeling of hope. It was a focal point to their nations, and a lot of times to Israel and even the Egyptians and even the Amalekites that we'll look at today, it was a symbol of hope because of the God that they worshipped. In Egypt, the Egyptians used to build their temples and put their nieces, their poles with their flags on it, where the flags would point to the inside of their temples. And their belief was is that it was pointing to where their God 
resided. In other words, when you saw the Egyptian Nisi and you saw the flags pointing inward, you knew they were pointing to something bigger than themselves. The Israelites and other armies would carry them as they would go into battle. The Israelites, obviously, that worship the one true God would hold their Nisi up as a symbol of the one true God who would go before them in the battle, but not just go before them, that would be with them in the battle and with them always. It was a sign and it was a symbol. And so the Nisis were very, very common in those days. We see in uh, Exodus chapter 17, if you have your copy of Scripture, I want you to turn there now because I'm going to walk you through a very familiar passage of Scripture. But the very first time that we see this name referenced to God is in Exodus chapter 17. Now, Moses had just led the Israelites out of Egypt. You know that story, most of us, if you're not. It's very simple. God called Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. His people were the Israelites. God's chosen people were oppressed and they were slaves to the Egyptians. And he sends Moses to lead the people out. He gives Moses a staff. And Moses, as he goes to lead the people out, as he goes to confront Pharaoh, the staff does many things. One time, uh, the Egyptians had, you know, their magicians or whatever did something with some snakes. Moses throws the staff of God on the ground, and his staff ate up the other ones. He used it to part the Red Sea. He used it to turn the, the Nile River into blood. And he leads the people out of Egypt and once they get out of Egypt and once they cross the Red Sea and they, they go through this period of going through the desert into the promised land, they come up on the Amalekites. And in Exodus chapter 17, starting in verse 8, it simply says this, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Now let me stop right there after verse 8. This is the first time that we see in the book of Exodus where Israel comes up against a battle after they had been freed. It's very interesting and it's very, very important that we understand that. Because after 400 years of captivity and and, and slavery by the Egyptians, and after Moses leading them out, and after them crossing the Red Sea miraculously, Now they come up against their very first opposition, their very first trial, so to speak, the very first group of people that they come across that don't like them. And they're about to go to battle. And they're about to be in a war. And they're about to be in a conflict. And it's the very first sign of conflict after their freedom. Now, that's very important because I want us to file that away because I think a lot of times we buy the lie as Christians that every time or that any time we come to Christ or when we come to Christ that everything's going to be, you know, sort of hunky-dory from then on out, and that's not true. And probably if you were like me, the very first time after you came to Christ that you came up against opposition, it scared the mess out of you and you began to question Everything you were taught and believed about what coming to Christ was like. Just file that away for just a second. Because in verse 9, it says this. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek. While Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So let's stop right there. So they're going into battle. Moses tells Joshua, choose some men and get ready and go into fight. And tomorrow I will take the staff. Now whose staff was this? Man, y'all are good. It was God's. I think a lot of times we get confused when we read or when we've been told a story for so long that we just begin to assume that because Moses held the staff that the staff belonged to Moses. Moses was very clear and I think it's very interesting that he was clear about this. He said tomorrow I will go on the top of hill with the staff of God. The same staff that God had been using previously. The staff that God used to deliver his people out of Egypt, the staff that God used to part 
the Red Sea. And now that they come across their first sign of opposition, again, what is God doing? He's going to use the staff given to his servant Moses. But how is he going to use it? It's very interesting. Verse 11. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. Now, let me stop right there. Whenever Moses held up his hand, what was in his hand? The staff. So anytime the staff was raised, Israel was winning. Anytime the staff was lowered, Israel was losing. Why? Why is up good and down bad? Why is up winning and down losing? What is the significance of him having to hold up a staff up <clears throat> for victory? And if it came down, no victory. Up good, down bad. I wrestled with that this week as I was studying it. And here's what I came up with. It always has been. <laughs> Think about it. It always has been. Up has always been good. Down has always been bad. You know, there's a story in uh, Numbers, chapter 21. You know, the exciting book of Numbers that we all spend our quiet time in. There's a very important story tucked away in the book of Numbers that is very significant and foreshadows what Christ did to purchase our salvation. It's very interesting. In the book of Numbers, I think chapter 21, Moses and the Israelites are wandering through the desert, and the Israelites do something we never do in church. They start complaining. They start grumbling. They're dissatisfied. They're, they just got their freedom, and now they're saying things like, we should just go back to Egypt. You brought us out here just to die. And so the very servant of God who's carrying the very staff of God that delivered the Israelites out of Egypt, and now they have their freedom, they're beginning to curse that God and curse that servant and saying things like, we should just go back to Egypt. We're going to die out here. And so what God does is God sends a bunch of venomous snakes, and the snakes begin to bite the people. You complain, you get bit. It's pretty simple math, right? And so the people come to Moses and they say, we have sinned against God. Tell God to take the snakes away. God does not take the snakes away. Instead, God tells Moses, get a pole. Think about that. Get a pole. Put a, put a snake, put a bronze snake on it and lift that pole high up in the air. And anyone who is bit by the snake, if they look at the bronze snake, they'll be healed. Y'all go back and read this. This is fascinating stuff. And that's exactly what happened. The Hebrew word in that passage that is used for pole is, guess what? Nisi. Moses made a Nisi and put a bronze snake on it so that the very thing that poisoned the people, if they looked high would save the people. What did Jesus do? What did Jesus do when he came? God lifted him high on a cross, and Paul said in one of his letters that when Jesus was on the cross, he was made to be sin so that those of us could have the righteousness of God. The very thing that poisoned us as people, God held high, and anybody that looks can be saved. Jesus was a Nisi there, and we see it here, and it's woven all through the Old Testament. If you don't think Jesus is in the Old Testament, do some study. It's fascinating. So up has always been good. Up has always been good. And so whenever Moses held the staff high, the Israelites were winning. Whenever he lowered it, they were losing. So verse 12. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and they put it under him, and he sat on it. While Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. So Moses, now knowing that up is good, down is bad. Up is winning, down is losing. Up is victory, all right? He begins to get tired, so Aaron and Hur... 
they devise this plan. They put a stone, they sit him on it, and then they raise his arms up so the staff of God will always be held high because they knew that up is good, high winds, okay? Ever heard this passage preached before? I've preached this passage before. Ever heard things like the focal point of this passage is when your brother is struggling, hold up his hands? Ever, I preached it, and it's true. I mean, that's a true principle. The focal point of this story is not Aaron and her, per se, and what they did. The focal point of this story is still the staff. God's staff symbolized his power, his authority, and his presence. And whenever Moses could have that staff lifted high as a Nisi, then God's people could look up. Remember where he was? He was up on a hill. They could look up and they could see and remember who was going before them, who was with them, and who was actually fighting this battle. The power and the authority and the presence of God. It's not a story about Moses getting tired and two good brothers helping him up. It's a great principle, but it's not what this story is about. This story is about the power and the presence of God to conquer the Amalekites. And any time the symbol or the Nisi was held high, God's people could look at it and they could know, number one, who was in charge, number two, who was actually fighting this battle, and number three, where the power and the presence and the authority lied. It was a symbol of God's presence. Verse 14, this is after the battle. The Amalekites are defeated, Israel wins. The Lord comes to Moses and said, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book. This is crazy. Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalekite from under heaven. God tells Moses, write this down. This battle, this thing that just happened, write it down and tell it to Joshua. Why are we telling it to Joshua? Well, we know that the torch is going to be passed to Joshua one day. Joshua is going to take Moses' place. And so write this down, tell it to Joshua, because I will blot out the memory of Amalekite forever under heaven. Why did he tell Moses to write that down? We don't know, but here's a couple of guesses. Number one, he wanted the story to be passed down from generation to generation because of what God did that day. I mean, that's pretty, yeah. Number two, Maybe, just maybe, he wanted him to write it down because although this was the first battle that Israel faced, as we know, this side of the Old Testament, it wouldn't be the last. And so the Lord wanted his people to know, not if, but when you go into battle. Not if, but when you go into the darkness that God goes before you, that God is with you, and that it's not your darkness and it's not your battle, it's actually God's battle to fight. And so I believe he tells Moses to write this down and whisper it in the, in the ears of Joshua, and now we, and we know that it's recorded in, in, in the book of Exodus so that generations would know And generations and generations ahead would know who fights the battle. Whose battle this is and what to do. And then in verse 15, after God tells him to do that, Moses has a response. Moses built an altar and he called that altar, the Lord is my banner. Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. All glory, all glory to God for the victory. And he builds an altar in remembrance so that future generations would know 
that future generations would walk up on that altar or hear about that altar or see that altar and the name of that altar was literally the Jehovah Nisi. That there was a battle fought on this day and that God's power and presence went before us and that God's staff was the symbol of that and we held that staff. Moses held that staff as a Nisi, as a symbol for God's people to look and to draw inspiration from because God was with them and God was over them and God was fighting that battle and that's why this altar to this day is called the Lord is my banner. Future generations would know of the hope and the power and the victory that they have for the Lord. So what does that do for us? Some thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years later. You know, one of the tensions Edward and I have been talking about all throughout this series as we're looking at these names. These are Old Testament redemptive names of God. We've been in the Old Testament now for, what, 10 weeks? And one of the tensions that we preach is we know that Jesus is woven all through Scripture. Jesus is in the Old Testament as much as he is in the New Testament. And so how do we bring these Old Testament redemptive names of God, these stories of God's power and what he did in Israel in the Old Testament, and, and the fact that Israel would commemorate and, and plant these names as, as a marker, as a spiritual marker, how do we tie that in to what Jesus is doing today? in us today, because that's what makes it applicable. You know, it's interesting in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. I stumbled upon this this week. Isaiah is prophesying, and he says, in that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. That root that he's talking about is Jesus. Isaiah says that there will come a day where Jesus will stand as a banner for the people, where Jesus will be raised up as a Nisi for the people, and not just the Israelite people, the entire world, the nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. Jesus was ultimately lifted high on the cross. Jesus ultimately was lifted high on the cross, and our salvation is purchased through what he did on the cross. But as Christians, we know the story doesn't begin. I mean, it doesn't end at salvation, amen? It begins. Because for those of us that are walking with Jesus, those of us that call ourselves Christians, we know that the moment that we came to Christ, a journey began. And at some point in our journey, 17 years for me, at some point in our journey, we came up against our first encounter post-Jesus, our first spiritual battle, our first entrance into darkness into a battlefield that only the hope of Jesus could get us through. You see, Jesus purchases us at salvation, but then he walks with us and in us through our entire life. This root of Jesse that will stand as a banner or a Nisi is not just a one-time thing on the cross. It's a lifetime application for us as we continue to walk with Christ. Because when, not if, when we're in the dark places, when we come up against the battle, when we face hard times, Jesus is our Nisi. Jesus is our banner of hope. Jesus ultimately is the one that purchased us and delivered us from sin so that we can walk in his righteousness. This is what God is to us, a banner of encouragement, a focal point that gives us hope, our Nisi. But here's the second thing, and here's the tension of the Christian life. You know, if you've ever been to membership, Joe Fields and I, one of the statements that we believe in, in, in at Summit Heights is Jesus is both Christ and Lord. Jesus is both Messiah and Master. Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, saves us, redeems us, sets us free, purchases us, 
gives us a new heart and a new life, a new way of thinking. That's Messiah. That's Christ. Jesus, the Lord, is someone that we follow. Christ, Messiah, is what he did for us. The Lordship of Christ is what we do for him only, not out of obligation, only in response to what he did for us. You know, it's very interesting when we talk about this, this idea of banner and this idea of mercy. It's very interesting because in, in one, one side of the tension, Christ is our Nisi. He was held high just like the snake in the desert that all, to, all that look at him can be healed and can be saved. That he still is held high today as a symbol of Christianity in what we believe. But here's the other tension. We also have been called to be Nisi's. Follow me. You know, back to my opening. You know, it's not hard to figure out who the Mississippi State fans are in the house. Amen? He's wearing a sweatshirt. It's not hard to figure out who the Dallas Cowboy fans are. I love the Sundays that the Cowboys play, especially if they play at 12. Our 9 a.m. service is packed with people in their Cowboy gear. It's not hard to figure out who the Longhorn fans are. It's not hard to figure out who the Aggies are. It's not hard to figure out who you root for. Because a lot of us will have t-shirts or we'll have hats and things of that nature. It's real interesting though as people that follow Christ. Do people know our loyalty is to him as much as it is to whatever school we root for? You see, the banners that we carry are very important to our mission in the outside world. How much more should we be carrying and bearing in our lives the honor of the one true Nisi, Christ? When we go out into our community, when we go out into our mission field, our jobs, our schools, our homes, our streets, the world that God has called us to, are we true representations of the God that we profess to serve? Paul said in 2 Corinthians that we are literally Christ's ambassadors. You know what an ambassador is, right? An ambassador is somebody that goes and lives in another nation to represent their home nation. We are literally Christ's ambassadors. If you go to an embassy in Russia, the United States embassy, you know what you see on the outside of the building? It's not the Russian flag. It's the American flag. Paul said, we are as Christians, Christ's ambassadors. When we go out into our community, look, there's nothing wrong with the nieces that we carry. I'm the biggest sports fan that there is. My closet is full of hats and jackets and t-shirts and things of that nature that represent every team that I root for. There's nothing wrong with that. But first and foremost, the thing that we should be wearing above everything else is Christ in us, the hope of glory. You know, what's real interesting is they would go into battle. The Nisis were external objects. They would either put them on a pole or put them on a flag. Even the staff of God was an external object. For us as Christians, it's not external, it's internal. Scripture is clear that the day that we come to Christ, that he, he takes away our sins, he imparts his, his righteousness, and he fills us with his Holy Spirit. Paul in Colossians said it this way, it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. When you go to work, do people see your niece? When you go home from here to your family members that want nothing to do with church or nothing to do with your Jesus, do they still see your niece? When you go out to school, students, do the other students in your school see your niece? Do you represent the God that you serve in the way that he's called us to. That's the challenge. You know, I really struggled this week, and I'll close, and we'll, we'll have our time of response, and I know this was short. You're welcome. 
But I really struggled this week with this part of the application. And I've shared this, I've shared this with the stage before, I mean from the stage before. You know, I can remember getting saved and it's like when you first get saved, you're like a fire hydrant, man. You're reading like entire books of the Bible during your lunch break. I mean, it's just, you're just taking everything in. You're in five different groups and being discipled. I mean, you're just doing all this and you're preaching and you're sharing and you're doing all this stuff. And it's like, you know, when God called me to ministry, I was like, I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing this. And then you wake up 17 years later and you're like, man you hit those kind of dry ruts. It, 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 has anybody ever been there? Anybody bold enough? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And sometimes you find yourself, and some of you that have been on staff before, you, you echo this because we've had these conversations. Sometimes you find yourself on staff doing a lot of stuff, and you actually have this thought, I did more ministry before I got on staff than I do now. And man, I really, really got convicted this week when I wrote those words down, when you go into your schools, when you go into your jobs, when you go across the street, when you go. And the Lord just convicted me that I don't know that I've been as good as a representation as he's called me to be. I do my job and I do it well. But man, this message challenged me this week. So the Lord, my banner... Jehovah Nisi, the Lord that goes before us, the Lord that resides in us, the Lord that is in charge, that fights our battles, that takes care of us, that provides for us, that saved us and continues to sustain us, that God resides in me, and that's the God that I want to lift high, as high as I can, and I want to carry that God across the street in my neighborhood into Brookshire's when I go shopping, to you as you come in to Summit each and every week. I want to be that Nisi and carry my Nisi high so that everyone can give glory to the God that I serve. And Summit, I challenge myself, but I challenge you as well. That this is the God that we serve, Jehovah Nisi. And every day and everywhere we go, we should be symbolically planting an altar similar to what Moses did in saying, the Lord my God banner. The Lord, my banner. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. We're going to have a time of response. This is the part of the service. If you're visiting with us this morning, we love to end every service uh, with a time of response. It looks a little bit different than what you may be used to. And so we're going to pray, and then the band is going to come back and sing. And this is the part where we, we take communion we have communion set up, two tables in the front and two in the back. And we just, we love to respond to God's word and to what he's done this morning uh, by worshiping and by taking communion. We'll also have some people up front. We have a wonderful prayer ministry and elder ministry. And some of our prayer team folks will be lined up at the front. And if you want to respond by coming forward and receiving prayer, then we invite you to do that as well. And so I'm going to pray for us. And then when I say amen, we invite you to respond. On, and then we want you to come back as we worship out with one last song. Let's pray. Father God, you're good. I thank you and I love you. And God, I'm reminded this week, just as Moses and Joshua wanted the people of Israel to be reminded of what you did that day in that battle on that hill, I'm reminded of February 2nd, 2002, the day you came into my life and rescued me. God, I'm reminded of how even through the ups and the downs and the highs and the lows that you never leave me and you never forsake me.
And then, Father, I'm reminded of everyone that sits out here this morning. Some of them I know, some of them I don't. Some of them I know their story. I know when their February 2nd was. And, God, what you did in them. God, may we never forget that. And may we live in such a way that represents what you did in us so that the world would know that there is a God and that his name is Jesus. Father, I pray for that one that sits here this morning that does not have that experience, that has yet to come to know you. Father, that they would know that you love them, that they would know that you're calling them. And Father, that maybe today they would respond for the very first time and come forward and and ask for prayer or whatever. But God, that you would just move in us as we sing, as we take communion as we pray and as we just finish this service out in worship to you. God, may you alone be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.